So, um, great, so, um, uh, glad to be here, um, so, uh, my name is, uh, Roberto Serrano, but, uh, you know, I, I, people just, I go by Robert, you can call me that, um, and I work with, uh, my host here, um, slash, uh, other host is, uh, doctors, uh, Nathan Lee and Dominic uh, Schlicher, and, uh, they are associated with the Departamento de Astronomia and, uh, Universidad de Concepcion, um, and uh, my, the topic of uh, my project here in Chile is uh, the dynamics and fate of black hole populations and rotating star clusters. So um, I have a little of uh, uh, my own background. Um, you know, um, I went to Stony Brook University in Long Island. I studied math and physics. Um, while I was there, like I was a NASA space, space grant fellow for a couple of years or where I started getting into some astronomy research. Um, I did uh, some industry work in Brookhaven National Lab for about a year, and uh, in between uh, my deferral and now, I was a uh, guest research at the Center for Computational Astrophysics at the Flatiron Institute, which is uh, funded by the Science Foundation. Um, so a little personal background is I was actually born in Guayaquil, Ecuador, and uh, then I immigrated to uh, New York City in the United States for about uh, one years old and became a U.S. citizen. Uh, has some uh, is interested sort of uh, the, uh, these are some of my hobbies I like to swim play volleyball uh, interested sort of like in some sci-fi fantasy video games typical I guess nerd uh, interest and I'm also actually really interested in philosophy so if you're interested in like modern or existential philosophy I'd love to chat about that and uh, yeah this is actually my first time like traveling internationally for about nine months so super excited uh, so some of the I guess um, context that you'll need sort of I guess for this talk is sort of uh, goes from like the very biggest scales of the universe so sort of like a cosmological context so um, the sort of concordance model of cosmology it seems to be this cold dark matter plus some um, a cosmological constant uh, lambda CDM and and in this model it predicts sort of uh, matter sort of uh, perturbations of matter density fields in the universe sort of uh, eventually grow very fast over time and form the first structure, large-scale structure in the universe, like such, which is the first galaxies and stars. And eventually over time, cosmic time, uh, these stars will evolve and some explode, leaving different compact remnants, white dwarfs, neutron stars, but some also leave uh, these uh, black holes, which are these objects uh, that are so dense and massive that you know light can't, can't really escape. So black holes actually, um, have a few properties. They have a charge, a spin, and a mass, but for this purpose, we'll just focus on sort of like the mass. And we want to sort of, uh, you know, you could sort of see by in this plot um, by uh, Monica Colby that uh, I like it because it sort of shows you sort of like the diversity and like the range of masses. You have uh, some black holes that are like uh, massive black holes that are sort of thousands or ten thousands of times the size of our sun. And you have also sort of, um, well, these uh, stellar mass black holes, which are typically the size of stars themselves, and maybe a little bit bigger. And then there's this gap, which um, people believe may be some sort of intermediate sort of mass black hole, which is in between the mass of sort of stellar mass black holes and massive black holes. And these haven't been observed, which is very interesting. Like you'll, you'll see on the y-axis, it, it's sort of like this, uh, the height and the filling in sort of shows you sort of like observations. So we see black holes that are like the size of stars. We see massive black holes in the center of galaxies, but we don't really see anything here. And it, it's interesting, you know, we want to know if there's actually something that exists in that range. Um, so you could ask, like, where would you find these different types of black holes? And so um, this first image on the left is a very famous, I guess, image of the black hole in, in the galaxy M87, which is a supermassive black hole. Um, in the centers of these galaxies, you typically find these very massive black holes that are like a thousandth the mass of a galaxy. But because you could also see like these the centers of galaxies as like these wells, many things over time fall into them. So you can find these intermediate mass black holes perhaps. Stellar mass black holes will probably also be present there since there are stars also in the galactic centers. And then as you go to the right, you start to see, for example, globular clusters. These are star clusters that are sort of orbiting around the centers of galaxies, um, some like like this one, Tuck 47, 
and in these you won't really find these uh, massive black holes but you'll find perhaps intermediate mass black holes but for sure there will be stellar mass black holes since you can see so many stars it's hard to believe that none of them will form some kind of black hole and then the picture on the right are sort of like in these places that you don't have that are not dense where you just have sort of like these field stars like separated um, there's a chance that you have um, black holes that are sort of formed in these uh, um, what are called sort of like these uh, stellar binaries so like you can see here like two stars that are orbiting uh, this red giant here will probably end its life and form a black hole and then you'll see a, you'll basically end up with a black hole that's uh, orbiting with a companion star and that's one way to observe them as well so um, I will basically focus on sort of this middle sort of picture, this sort of dense star cluster regime, um, which is sort of the realm of globular clusters and open clusters. And um, what you can, the basic picture is sort of that you have sort of these very dense environments of stars. And uh, there's this process called dynamical friction that sort of means that the heaviest objects will sink to the bottom and the lighter objects will sort of orbit around it. So which will eventually happen is you'll have some sort of mass segregation where you'll have like a core of basically black holes and then surrounded by sort of other stars. And basically once these black holes are all together, this population is in the core, a lot of like there's gonna be very strong like dynamical interactions and they can form binaries, which is a you know, two object system, a, a triple system perhaps, three object system and some of these black holes can merge due to emission of gravitational waves but basically these dynamical processes are, are so sort of like um, violent that basically they sort of just lead to a lot of these black holes being kicked or ejected from these star clusters. And this is so-called um, Spitzer instability and you could also see Sigerson and Hernkes who also perform a calculation like this. And what they typically predict is that um, current day globular clusters will have between zero to two percent of that population remaining. So um, in an optimistic case, maybe you'll have a couple of black holes in, in sort of these clusters or you perhaps could have none that, that remain. But um, a lot of these um, sort of these uh, historical sort of studies sort of ignore the rotation of cluster angular momentum or rotation, and uh, they also sort of um, don't take into account other sort of processes um, related to angular momentum like vector and scalar resonant relaxation. So um, we are sort of picking, trying to Decide, we want us to sort of model these star clusters and we want to sort of understand how these black holes get kicked. The kick is basically what will decide um, if, the, if the sort of black hole will get ejected or not from the cluster. And so quantifying that, the, how, like, you know, the amplitude, how far it goes from the center of this star cluster um, and the decay time sort of uh, has a role to play in that kind of um, ejection mechanism. And um, so if you see sort of like, this is a picture from Webb et al. 2019 um, that sort of uh, kicks sort of, it takes sort of these star clusters and then sort of assumes that it rotates like a solid body, which is not very realistic, but, um, well, I was, I was on the study, but it, it was like, um, it was just sort of like a, a way, to, it was like a way to sort of mimic rotation and sort of star clusters that normally don't rotate. It was like kind of like a trick that we did and um, but what you see basically is on the left is like when there's no rotation the the orbit just basically decays like like uh, very rapidly but you can sort of see that once there is rotation in the final three pa um, panels you can see that there is sort of like this effect like the, the black hole's um, amplitude sort of it decays rapidly but then there's a point where it starts to sort of like hover a little higher than you know the center and you know this means that um, that rotation does have a non-negligible effect on the, on the orbit. So we sort of will want to improve on this by basically uh, taking this miyamoto Nagai potential, which basically is sort of like, you could think of it as like a, a flattened sort of star cluster. So it's sort of like a disky structure. And this is more realistic in the sense that, you know, this is something that um, is more observed. Star clusters that rotate sort of have like some ellipticity to them like sort of more spherical towards the center, but then kind of like get stretched out like a pancake towards the end. So this is sort of like the shape of the cluster that we're like looking at now. And so this sort of has naturally built in rotation. And so um, we're sort of trying to just repeat the same sort of like study, but now with this more realistic potential. And I mean, we so this is sort of like a toy model in the sense that we have like there are caveats. So 
uh, you know, we have stars that are sort of like not really evolving over time. Um, they're all the same mass, so like a half of the mass of the sun, no stellar evolution, and um, there's only like, a, well, the cl clusters over time actually lose their mass because uh, they're sort of being tidally stripped by the galaxy, and um, so we don't take that into account, and right here we're only kicking like, for example, like one black hole, but in reality there's probably other things that are other black holes and to take into account. So these are the caveats, but for the sake of this study, we just want to know like how long if you kick it in this like you know and it's in this rotating cluster, how long does it take to get back? And so um, we want to sort of look at this from an analytical and numerical perspective. So um, we sort of think that once if you can calculate how long it takes for this black hole to sort of take get back into this cluster center, you can sort of also calculate how long it takes for others for some sort of dynamical processes that happen, sort of like binary formation, for example, from one plus one plus one scattering. So you can have a black hole that's in the center. If it gets scattered with other things, eventually it could form um, a binary. Um, there are also sort of things like so-called so -called partial slash tidal disruption events. This is when a star gets um, very near the black hole. It, it basically gets shredded of its envelope. Half of it gets thrown away, and then half of it sort of accretes onto the black hole. And then um, there's, you could also sort of try to figure out like the tidal capture time scale, which just means like um, it's not a disruption event, but the star will sort of become bound to this black hole and start to sort of uh, move around with it. And so these are sort of like analytical calculations, but then we sort of plan to com we want to sort of compare these results with expensive n-body calculations. And this is sort of part of the why Chile because. Uh, um, Universidad de Concepcion has this uh, very sort of advanced um, homemade um, sort of a computer cluster, Cultron, which is uh, just sort of like a it's just sort of a several hundred nodes, which means like several thousand cores with some GPU um, support, which allows you to do n-body calculations, which is sort of like you take one particle, let's say you have 49,000 other particles, then you can just sort of you sort of um, calculate the force of all those particles on one particle, and then force that that particle and every other particle has on every other particle. You advance, you know, you update their positions, you move a little bit forward in time, and then you repeat this. So this is uh, it's it's that's like basically the most like um, accurate result you can have, but it's also very expensive because the higher particle numbers you get to, the you know like the t the runtime scales like n squared. So. Um, so we plan to do that, and then if like you know time permits, you know maybe we can begin to sort of relax some model caveats, like you can actually have like sort of uh, stars of different masses, add more black holes, maybe add, add like some kind of tidal field, and you know then you get more close to like this very realistic picture. Um, and then some other goals that I had in Chile is really just to uh, accept, you know connect with the faculty and the students in the astronomy department at Concepcion and. Um, I'm trying to, you know, figure out some creative ways to do some outreach and to sort of uh, engage with the community, with, with you know, in terms of uh, astronomy. And then um, it would be nice to travel and explore Chile. Um, I've heard that there's uh, a lot of actually, um, up, like, sort of, there's a big observational actually community here. Like, I think um, uh, there's some observation in Atacama, but also in Las Arenas, there's um, a lot of astronomers that are, you know using telescopes and things, so it would be nice uh, to get out there as well. And so with that, I'll just leave uh, the slide, which is you know my contact information and you know, just uh, some references, and uh, thank you. Yeah, we have